The following program is produced by Marshfield Community Television. So let me let me start the uh, the, the Emerald Ash Borer talk. And you, I'm guessing you've been looking at the screen. It's been up here, and you probably have read it ten times, all of you. But I, I just want to make I don't know if anybody if you've heard of Durr's Hardy Trees and Shrubs. It's, it's a classic encyclopedic type book of trees around the world. I've got a copy. It's actually when I retired, I said, they said, what do you want for a gift in your retirement? I said, I want Durr's book. It's an expensive, it's an expensive book. Um, so wh whenever I start to talk on trees, I always look in his book. And just, just to see what he has to say about a particular tree. And this is what he said about the, about the genus Fraxinus, which is ash. He says, landscapes in the Midwest and East cannot escape the clutches of this every man's tree. Its tolerance of hot, dry, sweeping winds, wet and dry soils, and high pH environments makes it universally functional as a street tree or in lawns, parks, commercial plantings, or planters. Planters is interesting. I don't know if you ever want to plant an ash tree in a planter, unless you wanted to bonsai it. But, uh, but he goes on to say, and I left out some verbiage, but plants can, can contract, bore, and scale. His book was, this was the first printing of his book, 1997, and he was not referring to the emerald ash borer as one of the borers. I mean, he was referring to native borers. Ash has native borers, and uh, there is something called the ash borer, which is a native borer, and there's the uh, lilac borer, which uh, uses two hosts, the lilac and the ash, both green and, both <coughs> green and white, and there's carpenter worms. And there are a few others that are quite not as troublesome, but the ash, have, the ash in North America have, have co-evolved with those, with those borers. And although it can stress a tree, sometimes kill it, the tree has a certain resistance that it has developed to these borers. So you can have a nice ash stand, you may lose a few trees here and there from a bore, but it's not gonna decimate an ash plantation. So the, the thing, the interesting thing is, he mentioned boar, and it was the late 90s that the emerald ash borer showed up in North America. And um, it's, it's interesting, of course, he, he, would, he, would, he, he probably wouldn't have known about it because even though it showed up in the late 90s, it wasn't actually discovered until about 2002. So, it was here doing some of its dirty work and like the borer does, it, it, uh, it uh, starts gnawing away before you see the tree die right away. So it took several years to find it. So he did not, at this, at this point, even after the second printing, which is 2002, it was too soon for, the, for that to be recognized. Um, another little tidbit is um, the, um, the, the sad thing about losing the ash is the biodiversity that's, that's associated with this tree. Uh, there's 286 species of arthropods, insects, spiders, that associate themselves with this tree. And when the tree's gone, hopefully they'll find another host. And many of them are passive, it's just a home. And so that's, a, we often think of the loss of the tree, how sad it is, but think of all the species that are gonna lose a home also. And the, other, and the other point that I'd like to make is that there, and I, was, I was blown away, there are actually 60 species of ash around the world. And there are 16 species that are native to this country. I mean, I, I could barely name three or four. I had no idea that there were 16 species of ash in North America. I don't know what's gonna to happen to those other species. Most of them are, are kind of niche species located in, in relatively small areas. Uh, like blue ash. You ever seen a blue ash? I've never heard of it. Black ash is not even that common. Anybody have black ash on their property? Okay. Uh, okay, in your forest. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, but right right now the boar. The concern is the, uh, the boar is hitting the white, the green, and the black, um, and, and mostly the green because that's the one that was planted in abundance in North America to guess what? To replace the elm, the American elm, which, which went down in the late 30s, early 40s to Dutch elm disease. So 
It was a great idea, right? It's a fast growing tree, it's sturdy, it's got a nice canopy. Let's, let's replace all those elm with ash. It's, it's, the problem is our horizon is only about 50 years and you never know what's gonna come after that. Uh, that's the little bugger right there. And there's his dimensions, I won't read them off to you. And it, it's about a half inch long, about an eighth inch wide, so it's long. And uh, I guess if, if, you're, if you like beetles, that's, uh, that's a pretty critter. Um, now, there's lookalikes, and if you, if you really weren't familiar with the emerald ash borer, you might, you might say, oh my God, I've got emerald ash borer. In fact, I was teaching a class, a pond class on this property about the time that the borer uh, found itself in southeast Wisconsin. As far as we knew, it wasn't on this property. I saw a six-spotted tiger beetle. I didn't know what a six-spotted tiger beetle was, and I saw it crawling on the ground. I says, oh my God, we got the borer here. <laughs> And then with a little research, you find out it's a terrestrial beetle. It, does, it has nothing to do with trees. Uh, however, you got the bark gnawing beetle, which does have some similar colorations. And it's a, it's, it's a, the, the six spotted tiger beetle is, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it's about, um, it gets up to about a half inch long, like the emerald ash. The bark gnawing beetle is a little longer, about three quarters of an inch and uh, similar coloration. Um, it, it does find itself on trees, and you might, it, it gnaws on the trees, um, mostly getting um, things like aphids and insects out of the bark. It doesn't bore uh, extensively. It's more of a gnawer than a bore. But you might see that and think, ah, you got the emerald ash borer. Not. Um, this is probably the, the most exciting slide here. It's, it's, the, it's, it's two of the bugs mating. And shortly after, uh, it doesn't take long, she'll lay her eggs within a couple of days after mating. Pretty fast process. Um, the, uh, the borer doesn't live longer than 30 days. So they got a, they got a lot of work to do in 30 days. And after, after she mates, and after she lays her, the question is whether does she lay her eggs right away, but she's pretty, because. They mate pretty soon after they exit the tree through that they, that D hole exit. They uh, they're pretty hungry, and so they go to the canopy, and start munching on leaves, and then they find a place to lay their eggs. And it's usually it's a branch, a rather thick branch, high in the canopy, and that's why you have a hard time finding it right away, because you might see a branch die, and you think, oh well. And I'll get into how you can mistake it for, for some other disease, and which we did on this property. Um, so they essentially take over the canopy, branch by branch. It's got to be a fairly good sized branch. And then they move down the trunk. And this could take a couple of years before you actually see it. And, and by that time, you're infected badly. And of course, they, they move around. And they, at, after they're on one tree, they'll be on another tree. Here's the cycle. It can take from one to two years, dep depending upon when the eggs were laid. Um, there's the adult merging. She emerges, in, in, he and she, they emerge in, in uh, June and August. And um, they, uh, and like I said, she immediately is hungry and heads for the top of the canopy. Um, and they're, they're munching on a leaf there. Um, the, uh, the larvae are pretty good size. Um, they can be almost up to an inch long. And uh, the, larva, the larva doesn't look a whole lot different than the pre-pupa, but you can kind of see the form coming in the pre-pupa, the form of the borer. And finally, you can see the pupa definitely has the shape of the borer. Um, and you can see the dates at which it, 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 it can be a year cycle, but depending upon weather conditions, and when the eggs were laid, it's, it's very easy for that to be a two-year cycle. And, and the, uh, the, it's usually the pre-pupa that, pre that overwinters. Um, that just shows the size of the, of the, uh, of the larva up in the upper left-hand corner. And uh, it just shows uh, how they enter into the... Into the um, the cambium layer there. Now, here's a little bit of history. And like I said, it was originally found in southeastern Michigan. And I think, I, 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 
I don't recall offhand, but in and around the Detroit area. And, they, and because it takes several years for the, for the board to actually become visible because it starts up high and works down, this is why they believed it was here since the late 90s, because it was 2002 that they found it, and suddenly they found it good. There were approximately 10,000 trees infected in the area. Um, so the borer is thought to travel about one half mile to one mile a year. And um, the, it's interesting that if, 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 it, if it was found in 2002 in, um, in Michigan, um, the, uh, it, it, it uh, suddenly appeared, not suddenly, but the next place it appeared in, in a nearby state was in Illinois, in Kane County, at, on June 9th, 2006. I mean, they got the exact, <laughs> they got the exact day and date. Um, uh, let me just step back. I've got some notes on my page here, and I'm going to be a little remiss in not seeing, because the, the, the question, that, the, the number one question that you may ask, go ahead, somebody ask, how did it get here? It, probably shipping materials. I mean, uh, Michigan uh, is, is, a, is a great in and out shipping area, and it probably came in wood shipping material, and maybe uh, chips or something. Um, the other thing is, the other reason, I'll get to the Kane County in a minute. The other reason it wasn't detected is, is because it is up high, but there's another disease called ash yellows. I don't know if you're familiar with that, the forester is familiar with that. The symptoms are very similar. The leaves yellow, there's leaf drop. Um, it's, caused, it's, it's caused by a virus and there's no cure. It, the reason it, it was not detected in 2002 and it was there since the 90s, it was that very reason, is everybody's looking up at the branches and they're yellow and they're dropping, oh my God, we have ash yellows. And then reality set in um, when they, uh, Saw, the, saw what was going on with the bark. Total surprise, of course. Now let's go to King. So I said they travel about, they're no, they're, I, and I don't know how they arrived at that, if they put a little GPS on the back of one of them, and I have no idea. It's amazing what they can do with these critters. But a half mile to a mile. Okay, if you figure out the distance between, say, Detroit and Lily Lake in King County, um, it's, 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 it's not going to happen in that short period of time. Yes, in, in fact, if, uh, uh, if, it only, if it only travels at that rate, they, they did a little calculation, it would take 300 years for the borer to occupy the whole state of Michigan. So um, it has to, there, have to, there has to be other modes of transportation, and as you might guess, it's wood. It's logs, it's wood chips, it's firewood, uh, uh, nursery stock. So it can hitch a ride on any one or all of those things, and that is why it is all over the place so fast. Uh, so 2006, it's in Illinois, um, and not there again. I mean, uh, there's, it's, we're, I don't know how many miles Lily Lake King County is from southeast Wisconsin, but it's quite a few. It didn't fly here. It hitched a ride on firewood, I'm sure. And, um, it arrived in southeast Wisconsin in 2008. We at CINO didn't know that right away, but we learned from uh, our local forester at the time, which was Randy Cooper, that it was here. And, um, um, and it ended up, and here's a really interesting thing, of course this has to be firewood or wood chips. It ended up in, in Brown County, Green Bay in, in 2009. Um, so, it, it, we're, we, as humans, probably, sadly, do more damage to the environment and world ecology than any other creatures on the planet, and they're not, they're not always blameless. I mean, things are carried around on the, on the on fur of animals and on feathers, seeds and whatever, but uh, we sure have, we, I hate to, I hate to stand up here and, uh, denigrate the human race, but we have, uh, or the human species, I should say, but we uh, have really done, we have really have done a deal on the planet. Um, 
In 2009, it showed up, it already showed up in, in uh, St. Paul. Actually, and, and this, is, this is probably a sad statistic, it's, there's a 99% mortality rate on ash trees that are greater than five centimeters uh, dBH, <coughs> diameter at breast height. So they, they have no problem hitting saplings, even though saplings can only be about an inch in diameter, they'll, uh, they'll take a sapling down. I don't know how they even are able to tunnel, but they're able to, they can't, I'm sure they can't tunnel as extensively. The economic impact is, is vivid here. Um, June, June 2006, it was found there. In August 2009, that's what that road looked like. Um, I, I'm guessing those trees are gone and they're going to try to guess what to plant there that won't, uh, that won't uh, fail them in the future. So it, it'll be interesting and uh, it's, 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 it just shows the devastation. Um, so you can see here we are in southeast Wisconsin and, and the north looks pretty clean but you know like I said there's, it, there's some that came in Green Bay, ended up in Green Bay and this, there's a hot spot right here in, in Minnesota. Obviously, it ended up in St. Paul pretty early, so it's going to spread. But you can see where all the hot spots are. And it's, it's, it's now found in 27 states and in two Canadian provinces. Um, and the green, the green actually shows where you're going to find the majority of the ash in the country. And there's, there's, uh, there's some out west in different areas. But uh, the question is, how long is it going to take to get out there, and, and will it? Because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of dead space in here, but as we know, it can hitch a ride. So um, when, when, it's depleted, when it's depleted this region, I'm sure it's going to try to find something. Um, uh, I'll get to it, but they, they've already found where it has an alternate host, a non-ash host. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention that in a little bit. Um, this is, this is uh, the old world distribution of, of, of emerald ash borer. Um, you, you can, I missed the button here. You can, you can see um, western, this is, this, is west, this is a pocket in western Russia, and there's, uh, some, there's some pockets here in eastern Russia, and the rest is Asia, Korea, Japan, and China. Um, and also right down here, I, I, my geography isn't great. It looks like it might be northern Laos and part of China. Um, so the thing about it being there is that it has, it, the, the emerald ash board, as you might guess, ash grows, the, the ash, there's several different species. Uh, the, Manchurian, the Manchurian ash is one of the most common ones. They have co-evolved with this borer. And like we, like in North America, North American ash has co-evolved with its boar. It had thousands of years of evolution to co-evolve with the boar. Over, when it ended up here, uh, there were only years available to co-evolve. Obviously not enough time for evolution to take place. So this is, this is why the problem exists, is uh, it got Trans, I don't know what to do about this in the future. I don't know how we're going to keep that from happening with other, other invasive species. I mean, it's, it's, it's happened with plants, but it's, it's, it's even more critical when you talk about uh, uh, beetles and even microorganisms transferring these things around the world to areas where there's no resistance to them. Now, there are treatments, and the, the treatments do work. They're expensive. I, somebody said he was treating. Um, Here. Oh, you were treating. Yeah. How, how much are you paying? Is it every two years? It's about, it's about $250 for the powder to treat five or six trees. Oh, you're doing it on your own? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, generally, they, I, I'm not sure if, if, if the concentration is going to be high enough. To, you, may not have, you may not have the bore yet, but, but one of the, the, uh, the really highly concentrated um, Insecticides cannot be purchased w without a license, so you got to be an arborist. And so, this, this you don't need a license. You don't, and so it's a, probably a lower concentration. And you'll probably you'll you'll find some arborists raising their eyes, saying, 
You might get some protection, but it may not give you full protection. You may have to end up uh, um, hiring an arborist. Um, I won't get into, there's, there's, you can do a, a soil drench. Those are the two um, um, insecticides. I won't get into the, the, the mode of action, but I don't know if, you, if any of you recognize imidocloprid is a neonicotinoid. And, you, and if you've been reading, been reading about things lately, you'll notice that neonicotinoids are pretty much right up there getting the blame for colony collapse syndrome. Um, and um, in fact, there was a recent paper that just came out. I kind of follow this stuff. I'm kind of a nerdy guy. I, I was a scientist I, for th 37 years at, uh, at a pharmaceutical company, so I can't get away from it. But anyway, um, yeah, and so the, the soil treatment probably isn't as bad, but they can also, they, they also can spray it in the canopy, and that's really bad, and you don't want to do that. So they're trying to get away from that. The other thing is um, trunk injections. Trunk injections are probably the most ecologically sound thing to do. You have to actually drill holes in the trunk. I don't, you're probably using a soil drench, is what you're using? Yeah. Uh, it's the most effective. It's, it's slow. You got to get the, you, because depending on the size of your tree, you got to get it distributed up into the canopy. Because remember, that's where the little bugger starts in the canopy. It's got to go through the systems. It can take up to six weeks. So it's best to use it as a preventative measure before the boar arrives. If he's already there, it's going to be tough to, to knock him back. And there again, here's, here's a, here's a, uh, here, uh, the, the imidacloride is also used in, a, in a, a, an insecti called, insecticide called imamectin. It's basically the sort of stuff that you put on your dogs. Uh, it's, it's, it's a milvomycin, which is, which is a flea and tick and uh, heartworm preventative. And it happens to be active on this beetle. And uh, it's also, and it's, uh, um, it's a little bit more expensive, but there's another reason why it's a little more popular, and I'll get to that. And then there's, uh, you can actually do a basal trunk spray with, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm never sure how to pronounce this, but I'm gonna call it dinotafuran. This is the backyard of my son's house. He lives in Libertyville. And uh, as soon as he saw, as soon as that boar hit, hit Libertyville, he started seeing the ash trees dying around in his neighborhood. And uh, they've, got, they've got seven trees on their property. They're beautiful trees. And uh, he plans to sell his house in about 10 years. And it's really going to drop the valley. It's going to look like a wasteland there. So he, he decided he was going to put money out to try to save them. So he contacted an, an arborist, and um, triage is actually this emamectin that I showed you on the previous slide, emamectin benzoate. It is the more, it's the most, one of the most expensive ones of all of them, but you only, need, you only need to do it every two years. And so all the others have to be applied every year, even though, even though they're less expensive. So overall, when you hire an arborist, you gotta pay him to do it. Um, it's actually a cheaper way to go. And it, co and it costs $9 per circumference inch, inch, and his biannual cost for seven trees is, is $1,500 for seven trees. Um, not, not a lot of people can afford that. And, and, and there's a lot of ash dying in Libertyville because they can't, but uh, he can. And I, I think it, so far his trees are doing okay. He's been doing it, I think, since 2010. So um, uh, there's a success story, but uh, that's something you, uh, if, you've, if you own forested land, that's totally, um, unless you, you're going to save a couple of trees, but you, the forest is going to have to fend for itself. All right, so the purpose of this, I, had, I started out with all the introductory information, and now I'll tell you a little bit about our experience here at CINO. Jerry Lapidakis was our CINO project manager at the time uh, that this email was sent out by him in, 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 in 811. And 
He mentioned that there were several hundred white ash trees showing symptoms of poor health. And by the way, most of the ash trees we have on this, had on this property, and so we still have some, they're dead, are white ash. Um, and what came to mind, like I said, it had the perfect symptoms for it, yellowing of leaves, leaf drop, uh, ash yellows. And, um, but, uh, th and, and there was no tree trunk evidence of EAB. Uh, he did further note that he had observed a few sick trees as far back as 2009. Guess what? It arrived in southeast Wisconsin in 2008. So in, in hindsight, all this starts to fit together. Um, in, so it, uh, in, 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 in October of 2011, we contacted Mark Guthmiller. I don't know, you might know Mark, um, DNR Forest Health Specialist and asked for his advice. He came out, same thing. He looked around, no evidence. He thought that the symptoms, again, fit ash yellows, and there's not a thing we can do about it, and hopefully it won't, it won't infect the other trees. And uh, so we kind of just sat around and thought about it <laughs> until 2013. Then, then there were, there were several hundred dead ash trees on the property. This looked like a little bit more than ash yellows. And, uh, and another, another uh, thing you want to watch out for if you've got a lot of ash on your land, listen for woodpecker activity. Even though you can't see the telltale sign underneath the bark down below, you're hearing a lot of woodpecker activity. It's up in the canopy probably. Um, it was Randy Cooper, who was our DNR forester at the time, he's now retired. He's, he's the one that saw the clear evidence of the bore. And there's the, the classic serpentine uh, tunneling uh, in the cambium. And, um, and then, now that we knew it was there, it didn't take a whole lot of observation. And you can start to see how the trees were going. You can see the bark splitting here, you can see bark splitting here, there. You can even, you can even go back in a little further here, you, uh, right there. So there you go. And this was, this was taken in early spring and uh, those trees never leafed out, obviously. Now we had some decisions to make. Uh, we had to develop a strategy to deal with this. And, and, and actually, one of the strategies, strategies was to just let them stand, let them die and stand. They will, uh, they'll, they'll serve as, uh, as, um, as uh, trees for, for uh, what am I trying to think? Uh, what's the tree I'm looking for? A, a, a cavity dwelling, 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 snags. Serve as a, a plantation of snags. I mean, usually you have a snag every once in a while in your woods, but uh, snags. But, uh, and that was actually considered because of the expense in having to, to cut all those down. And um, we, uh, we tried several times to get a logger to come in. In fact, the first contact we made with a logger, uh, there aren't many loggers that log down here. In fact, there's only one that I know of, and he was the one we contacted. We asked him if he knew of anybody else, and he very bluntly says no. Um, but he, his first thought was, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, in fact, he would give us, he, would, he said he would pay us five, five bucks a board foot for him. Um, and a lot of them, not all of them, uh, most of them are probably poles. And they, but some of them could be saw logs. But anyway, <coughs> we were happy to hear that. We weren't gonna have to pay him to come and do it. In fact, he was having a harvest across the road, across the road where they, it's primary uh, conifers. And we said, okay, well, you're gonna be over there in the winter, but how about coming over here and do the, and do the, uh, the harvest? Well, he did the harvest over there, disappeared, never heard from him again. I tried calling him a couple of times. He did get back to me once. He says, ah, I, had second, I got second thoughts about it. And so we had no logger. Um, so uh, we decided we're not gonna let him stand. And besides, if we let them stand, we would have to, it's MFL land, we got to plant. So we would plant in between and they would fall down. Eventually the dead ones would fall down and they'd probably crush the seedlings. And I'm sure a lot of the seedlings would survive, but it would be an ugly planting for sure. So we decided we're, we're gonna try a different road. We're gonna recruit volunteers to do the harvest. Um, it, it was successful. 
but it wasn't without issues. Um, and here's how it went. Um, we decided that we needed at least eight volunteers with chainsaws. And that if, and they would get free wood, obviously. I mean, all of the guys that, that, that stepped up um, had uh, re some, some land and they had wood burning stoves. Some of them actually heated their house or their outbuildings with wood burning stoves. They were happy to get the wood. So it ended up about five cords per person, give or take a cord or two. Um, there was, there's always a liability issue when you have people come onto your land and start cutting and doing things. And um, we found three of the volunteers had certified chainsaw training. We needed that. We couldn't have somebody coming in who was waving a chainsaw around without having at least, at least um, um, the, the first course in chainsaw training. So that we had five, had, had five that had no formal training. So we put our heads together and we thought, okay, we're going to hold a fist of chainsaw safety uh, course down here uh, for a chainsaw, saf <coughs> chainsaw safety one, course one, the very basic course. The problem is we only had five guys that needed it and they needed 10 participants to put on the course. And so we needed five more, of course. And, um, and we, hard, hard to get them with no enticement. So we had a clever idea. We said, okay, there, there's people around who need this certification for various reasons. They may work for an arborist or, or, or whatever. And um, so the Cena board um, got together, put our, heads, put our heads together, and we said, okay, we'll offer a 50% cost share. These people need to take a course anyway, so we'll give it to them for half price. And lo and behold, we got, we got 10 folks and more. And we paid, I think we paid for 12 or 13. Uh, cost shared, and uh, um, and and the other the other caveat, I, we um, some of them hesitated a little bit, but I said we had to have them sign a waiver uh, to hold uh, our organization harmless in case of a mishap. In case you got people cutting cutting down trees, even though they have a chainsaw safety one, sometimes they don't think, and the tree falls in the wrong direction. You got somebody cutting right next to you, so things can go wrong. And even though we had, we, um, I, I, I took them aside and explained some of those things just to be sure that there was no unintentional stupid things done. Um, okay, so we had a successful harvest. Um, the, cutting, the cutting notices were approved in 11.6 to harvest four acres of white ash. On 11.8, on um, we, we held a one day chainsaw safety class um, we marked four acres into, uh, into half acre units for the eight volunteers and the harvest was completed in, uh, by June of 2015 and it was a lot of bare land out there. Um, the, um, so now, like I said, it's all an MFL. We, we need to, we, 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 we're obligated to reforest. And so uh, we're a nonprofit. It's an expensive, it's an expensive uh, undertaking. So we wrote a grant. Uh, it's Wisconsin. If you're not familiar with it, it's called WIFLGIP. It's the acronym. And uh, uh, the person who administers that grant laughs when they say because uh, a lot of the a lot of the people that get that grant sometimes feel gypped by the amount of money they get. So. They call it, they call the acronym Wiffle Chip. It's Wisconsin Forest Landowner Grant Program. And it's meant for this very reason when there's some hardship, fire or whatever, and you gotta replace the trees, it's pretty easy to get this grant. You pretty much have to add, just ask for it. And it's a cost, it's a 50%, uh, yeah, I forget what, if it's 50%, I think it is, cost share. And, 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 we're, and so we need to plant, in order to get the right stocking ratio on that four acres, we need to plant 3,500 seedlings. Well, that takes volunteers, and we decided, and, oh, and before we did that, we forced, because we, um, not only did they harvest the trees, they did brushing. In order to get to the trees that was thick with brush, we had these huge piles of slash and brush that was cut during the harvest, uh, delimbing, and we, we brought a forestry mower in, and that, we used part of the grant for that, and they, they flattened out all those, um, those, uh, those piles and so making it much easier to plant the next year. So we planted 
Uh, so we planted in uh, 2016 with the help of a scout troop 303 who actually meets on this property and they we we'll let them use our facility with the the idea that they will help us do things they will volunteer and we split this we split the planting into into two years we planted 750 on two acres this this year next year we'll plant another 1750 on the remaining two acres as i said now i'm not going to go into this in great deal but just to show you kind of what the approach now is being taken this has nothing to do with the you know, this i'm getting going back to the emerald ash borer problem overall in this country and these are the strategies that are currently being taken and it's, most of this is being funded by the usda um, one of the strategies is, okay, germplasm, it's a fancy word for seeds um, and the content. So they're gonna look for, they're gonna, they're gonna gather the seeds from ash in various areas, they're gonna plant it and they're gonna subject it, subject it to the emerald ash borer to see if there's any resistance at all. It's a long process and you're not gonna see results very early. Um, and lingering ash. Um, if you have an ash stand and the borer goes through it and you find a couple of standing, for God's sakes, contact the DNR. That could be, a res they could be resistant or partially resistant. They might get sick, but the ash might move on. I mean, the borer might move on and that tree, will that tree might recover. That's exactly what happens in Asia. The tree gets sick, it recovers. Um, biochemical mechanisms. Um, uh, that's that. What's going on inside the cambium, chemically and biochemically? Um, looking for looking looking at the by looking at the at the ash borer in how it functions in how the how the ash functions in Asia, how it how it makes itself resistance biochem how it makes itself resistant biochemically, is another major product, and then of course looking for genes, and the types of proteins they make that might be. Uh, that, that might help in resistance. And uh, the other thing is hybridization and back crossing. It's what they did with the ch American chestnut. And they've, they've achieved. I mean, we now have an American chestnut that is resistant to the, to the blight. Uh, and and um, so it actually, I, I think as of now, it's ready to be planted, but there's a lot of pushback because it's now it's now a genetically modified species. It's not totally a natural chestnut. In fact, in Wisconsin, um, there was an article published in Woodland Magazine. For you, you guys who are WOA members, if you, if you read Woodland Magazine, there was an article about uh, a problem of planting this, this particular modified um, chestnut on MFL land. So we're gonna to have to get over the hump. It turns out that if you look at the genetics of it, it's like 1% other than American chestnut. So we just kind of get kind of, it, yeah, it's genetically modified, but now if you look at the Manchurian ash in, in China, here's, here's, here's some of the unique features that it does have that ours don't. It's got, um, it's got some unique lignans Lignans are, are compounds, uh, not getting too chemical here, that are put together with various types of compounds in large molecules that find themselves in the cambium. And they, they, they serve functions, various functions, including transport. And uh, it also has an overexpression over of defensive proteins. Our ash, our American ash species, have defensive proteins against its borers but not these found in, found in the Manchurian ash. And um, it, it's interesting that the compounds that get put together to make the lignans are very similar in number and structure to our black ash. So there might not be a lot of work to be done. It could be that we just a little bit of, 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 of fussing around, we can get to a point where we can actually create a resistant ash like they did with the, um, with the American chestnut. And th these other things are very important. Peroxidase activity, lignin polymerization, which I said was put these into the lignans, and the rate of enzymatic uh, 
uh, phenolic oxidation, uh, I won't get into that. And all of these things stress the feeding larva. All of these things put together make it difficult for the larva to feed. Uh, it may, it, many of them might die. It's just, gonna, it's, it's just gonna, some will live, but it's gonna cut down on the numbers. If you cut down, it's a numbers game. If you have fewer boars, you have few of them to attack the ash tree. Um, all right, here's the general conclusions about where we are at today. Sadly, it's 100% mortality in all size classes of one inch or greater DBH. Ash regeneration has, has ceased. There is a, there's a not enough uh, seeds, seed base, seeds in the soil to keep this going at this point in time. Even if it did grow up with the borer around, as soon as it gets to be the size of a sapling, it's gone. There's little potential for silviculture approaches for EAB proofing a stand. In other words, there's nothing you can do. The forester over there knows what silviculture is, and I'm sure you all do. All the effort that goes into growing trees, all the things you can do, soil, um, uh, light, uh, diversity, um, all that sort of thing. There's nothing you can do. You can't um, just by say mixing it up with a bunch of other trees is not going to help. Um, widespread mortality and gap formation are having. This is this is what's now happening. There's over 200 some species, uh, insects, spiders, that find their homes on ash. Yeah, what they're going to do, I don't know. This is not to even. Um, you think about the economic impacts and. For example, um, if, you, if, you look at, um, if you look at the number of, of ash in, say, Minnesota, they've got more than we have in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we have plenty. Um, right now, it's estimated that Minnesota has a billion ash trees. One billion. It's going to take a while for the ash board to get through it, but the way, but the way it gets transported, uh, it's going to, the state's going to look pretty sad. Um, the, the cost for the next 25 years, because of the bore, cutting down the trees, replanting, is estimated to be $7 billion to the country as a whole. It would, it's a, you can, it would be a sum of, uh, government and, and uh, individual expense, seven billion dollars. So you, you're losing a tree, you feel bad, but you often don't think about the, the economic, uh, we, we think about the ecological, but we don't think about the, the, uh, the economic impact. And, uh, and that's all we need. Our government needs another economic impact to, to keep it busy. Um, as I said, the Manchurian ash right now, they're looking at it as a source of resistant genes. And that's, that's going to be an important, that's going to be important research. And then there's this lingering ash. Remember, you got ash on your property and they're all dead but one. Don't ignore it. <laughs> Tell somebody. Because that could be the one, the one they want. Because um, I don't know if you know that, but there is a stand of chestnut that escaped the, uh, the blight. And uh, I think it's in Wisconsin somewhere. Do you, do you know where that is? Is it in Michigan? Okay. Um, it's a, I don't know how many trees, but they've, they've, they've managed to, uh, through treatment and keeping it secluded. And they don't know for sure if there's any resistant ones in there, but they managed to keep that stand alive. But now we have the, now we have the, the genetically modified uh, uh, chestnut tree, so it's, it might be a moot point. So we do know, so resistance breeding um, is underway, and that would be crossing, doing several crosses with, say, the Manchurian ash. You cross it with that, cross it again, cross it again, until you, sit, until you get what looks like an American ash, but the, the uh, biogenetics would be partly Manchurian ash. You wouldn't know it by looking at it. That's another approach. It's not as popular because it tends to mix two trees. And, and the other thing is that's, that's, that's important and it's working, at least for now, at some expense, is insecticides. And the other important thing that I have not gotten 
and I just not enough time to touch on it, and you could spend an hour talking about biological control. There's a lot of work going into that. In fact, shortly after, uh, they realized right away at, at the University of Michigan, since this is where the, the, the ash borer arrived initially, that they started a program right away looking for parasitic wasps. And they did find some North American parasitic wasps that did, that did lay their eggs on the, on, the, uh, on the eggs of the emerald ash borer within the tree, but they weren't very effective. They, the, when the eggs hatched, they weren't very effective at killing the, at, at killing the uh, larva. So it helped. I'm sure a few got killed, but they, they eventually decided they're going to have to go to China and get the, and get the parasitic wasps that, that have co-evolved with the Manchurian, uh, emerald, the, the Manchurian ash. And um, they brought over three species, and they did a lot of studies to see if they were going to survive here, first of all, and, and, and uh, they did. And they released them into various parts of the Midwest in 2009. And there's two that have been performing quite well. Again, it's not 100%. And um, we're not going to know uh, for several more years how effective it's going to be. But I was telling... Jim, who, is, who is, uh, has a lot of ash, that if you've, if you've got an ash stand, and if it's not infected, or at least you think it's not infected, you can write to the University of Michigan, and they will ship you the wasps. You can release them on your, on your property. So um, it's, it's, it came a little bit too late for us, because it was in 2009 that they started working on it. Um, that they released them, and uh, there again, it was, it was uh, about the same time we were dealing with our problem here, a little too late. But, um, so that's where the situation is today in terms of research. Um, so, like I said, uh, it's a little late for us, but it's a beautiful tree. I hope something comes from all of this. It, um, I, I hate to see another tree go down, like the ones that, like the others, like, like the species before it, but uh, so we'll be hopeful.